My Lord, I am Tara Adek, Baroness Hisham Gadia. You are the counsel for the appellant, Besborough College. My learned friends opposite, Hena Maniki and Martina Nimblad, appear for respondent, Miss Martin. My Lords, there are two grounds of appeal in this instant case. I will deal with the first, and my junior counsel will deal with the second. Have your Lordships had the opportunity to see the skeleton argument? We have. I'm obliged. My Lords, would you like a brief outline of the facts of the case before you today? Yes, please. Miss Martin wrote to the head teacher stating that she would choose Besborough College over another if she's exempted from the uniform. The head teacher confirmed she'll be exempted, but when fear and disciplinary issues, he departed from his original promise. If my lords have no further questions on the facts of the case, I shall proceed to my submissions. My lord, I have three submissions. If it pleases your lordships, I will proceed in my first submission on the ground that there was no legitimate expectation in the first place. In the case of the Crown and North and East Devon Health Authority, ex parte Coughlin, to be found in the Queen's Bench Decision 2001, starting on page 213 and on page 3 of your bundles, would your Lordship like to be reminded of the facts of the case? Yes, please. This case concerned a disabled resident at a nursing home. When she moved in, she was promised that it was a home for life. However, later the Health Authority believed the home had become uneconomic and proposed to close it. For the Health Authority to break its promise to Ms Coughlin, there needed to be an overriding public interest, compelling circumstances which was not apparent. My Lords, you will see that on the page of your bundle that there is a test to establish legitimate expectation. It was held the promise of the House and for Life was held to be lawful, unambiguous and a reasonable promise that induced a substantive legitimate expectation. I will now apply this test to the instant case. The head teacher's decision to exempt the student from school policy was lawful, was not lawful, I apologise. May I please refer your Lordships to the Crown and Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food, Ex Partes Humble, Fisheries Limited, 1995, to be found in the second volume of the All England Reports, starting from page 714 and on page 5 of your bundles. Would your Lordships like to be reminded of the facts of the case? Yes, please. The Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food declined A's request for a licence for its vessel because of changes in governmental policy. A applied, a applied for judicial review of that decision, contending that by the date of the change of policy, it had an, a legitimate expectation that any change in licensing policy would not be such as to frustrate the completion of the process of licence combination for the trawler. It was held that legitimacy was a function of expectations induced by government and of policy considerations, which affected against their fulfilment. If my lords could please pay attention to the highlighted section on the page, it states that no individual can legitimately, legitimately excuse me, please, expect the discharge of public duties to stand still or be distorted because of that individual's peculiar position or expectation. It further asserts they will be wrong to allow changes to public policy to be unduly fettered. Therefore, the student's expectation to be exempt from policy is not legitimate and therefore cannot stand as, a, as reasonable because it affects a wider policy. The second ground of the test is an ambiguity. I submit that the head teacher's email was clear. The last ground of the test is reasonableness. Sorry. Um, in the case of the Crown versus Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food, this was a, a public uh, a duty again, on a public policy. How does that, uh, why is that relevant? How, why should that be applied to uh, a school? Um, in all due respect, my Lord, we are trying to show the connection between a public policy and a school's policy, where there are rules that need to be um, acted on. School can't make decisions slap dash. <clears throat> well, not, none of these cases are really on the same type of points, are they? So, would you accept that the court's got to interpret the situation it finds based on these principles, and that that's effectively what it's done? It's come to a conclusion based on applying the principles, but none of these cases say that's a wrong decision, do they? Um, yeah, with all due respect, my lord, um, it's due to interpretation of this, uh, this, the cases that have been beforehand, and all we can do is interpret it in the best way possible. So then, so it's a matter of interpretation for us? 
Yes, this isn't a fight. These are these are cases which are persuasive. Yes, my lord. The last ground of the test is reasonableness. The moral principle of utilitarianism is found within the legal system as it aims to cause more good than harm. I submit that it was not fair for the head teacher to enforce the uniform policy on the majority, who were also disgruntled about the look of the uniform and allow exemption to the minority. It was an immoral and unethical decision against the public interest. Based on the Coughlin test, the head teacher's exemption was neither lawful nor reasonable. Therefore, it could not constitute a substantive legitimate expectation. My second submission is based on the findings of, on the finding of legitimate expectation in the Coughlin case. I submit that it was easily found because the council only suffered financial detriment. However, in this case, there will be a greater detriment. If it, if it is found that there's a legitimate expectation, it affects wider policies, such as equality and discrimination, which my junior council will elaborate on. My learned friends opposite will tell you that it was unreasonable for the teacher to not consider the distress of bullying about the uniform. But it is the legal duty of authority to enforce discipline and unity, which outweighs the opinions of neighbouring schools. My well, lords. Wouldn't they say they should have thought of that before they made the decision? It's a bit late when you made the decision. Could you repeat that question, please, my lord? This is one thing to rely on discipline when it comes around to enforcing the decision and the, the rules, but if you've already made a decision and created an expectation, isn't it a bit late then to rely on? going back and saying I've got to discipline the students. Um, by all due respect, my lord, um, my argument is that there was no, in fact, just some expectation. So we don't get that far? No, because his decision was not lawful, neither was it reasonable, so therefore he has not created that expectation. My lords, this brings me to my third and final submission, that there was no previous policy to support the head teacher's decision to exempt the child from the school's policy. It was held in the Crown on the application of ex and head teachers and governors of Y School 2006, which can be found in the High Court of England and Wales from page 298 and page 6 of your bundles. But my Lordship would like to be reminded of the facts of the case. The claimant Muslim schoolgirl sought judicial review of the decision of the head teacher refusing her to allow her to wear her niqab belt to school. Her three older sisters had attended the school and been permitted to wear the niqab. The school told X that the Najab did not conform to its school uniform policy and asked X to remove the vow, otherwise she'd be excluded. She, had, she argued that she had a legitimate expectation of wearing the Najab and secondly, her sisters had been in a similar position to her but had been allowed to wear the Najab at school. Her legitimate expectation claim failed where there had not been a practice, let alone a regular practice, amounting to a representation that Y would permit X to wear a Najab. Secondly, there had been a such a representation, why had departed from it for good reasons, that there was a proportionate response, having regard to legit legitimate aims pursued by the school in the public interest. And lastly, X had not, entitled, had not been entitled as of right to the same treatment as her sisters, where she had entered the school many years after them. During the inter interval there, there had been many changes in why, including the change of head teacher and justified changes in policy. Similarly to the mentioned case, the school has never permitted exemption despite complaints from other students. The case found that it is acceptable for legitimate expectation to be founded upon an established course of conduct in the past, rather than any specific promise as to conduct for the future. Therefore, it is unreasonable that the head teacher's exemption can be relied on as a legit legitimate expectation with no precedent. Furthermore, the decision was proposed. Can, can I just interrupt? If you don't allow policy to be changes in policy to be established then you'll never have those precedents to rely upon. Yeah, by all due respect, my lord, um, when it's concerning change in policy, it should be done with the governing body. There's more thought process towards it. Furthermore, the decision was proportionate because there were overriding circumstances, because the teacher feared disciplinary issues which will, which will be further developed by my junior council. My lords, to conclude, I submit that there was no substantive legitimate expectation in the first place. I have found this based on the case of Coughlin, which provides a test of legitimate expectation. And I have shown, that, I have shown you that although the teacher's exemption was unambiguous, it was neither lawful nor reasonable. Furthermore, my second submission highlights that there was a wider detriment to finding a legitimate expectation in this instance. 
which will cause disputes that may result in a breach of human rights. Lastly, Ms. Martin claims to have found a legitimate expectation founded on specific promises. Sorry, in the future. one thing. Um, is not the discrimination actually in the fact that it was just girls who were asked to ridicule themselves in this costume when this is a mixed state school, so the boys could go around looking normal and girls had to look silly in pink and green top and skirts? Okay. Is that not where the discrimination is? All due respect, my lord, it was the school's policy to allow the children to be separated, boys and girls in different uniform colour, wasn't of any preference. And lastly, Miss Martin claims to have found legitimate expectation founded on a specific promise in the future, which is insufficient. Legitimate expectation must rely on conduct from the past. Unless I can be of any further assistance to your lordship, those are my submissions. Thank you.